Well, thank you for having me here. I have a vague recollection of having spoken in a room like this, but I'm not sure if it's the same room uh, a couple of years ago. Are all the rooms the same, the, the quad rooms? Oh, it's the same room. OK, so I haven't quite lost my mind yet. That's reassuring. Uh, normally, I would have spent most of the, uh, the, the duration of my remarks speaking about Gaza and also the Mavi Marmara, what happened in the flotilla on May 31st. But now there are serious developments unfolding quite literally as I speak and as you sit in the audience, uh, which may culminate in something quite uh, awful in Lebanon. Uh, I, s I don't like to use the word conspiracy or plot, uh, but sometimes there are conspiracies and plots. Uh, in 1956, the tripartite invasion of the Suez was a conspiracy and a plot. And it seems to me that uh, those words do apply to what's now unfolding as the Western powers concert with Israel to prepare for a uh, softening up of Lebanon uh, with the, long, the, the longer term goal of uh, ridding Lebanon of the Hezbollah, the party of God. And those are really, I think, quite sinister machinations that are going on now, which might culminate or climax in something really terrible. Uh, so I will devote a significant part of my remarks to looking at what's happening there. And um, even though I don't like to speculate, because speculation is the sort of thing where if you get it wrong, you look very foolish in retrospect. But here I will curb the concerns of my ego, and I will speculate because I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done beginning right now to prepare for and to the extent possible to avert what's being planned for that uh, unfortunate, hapless place in the world. I'll begin by looking at what happened in Gaza in 2008-9 then look at what happened in the Freedom Flotilla. But the story actually begins, if time allowed me, the story actually begins in May 2000, when after a 17-year-long guerrilla war, the uh, Hezbollah, the party of God, evicted the Israeli occupying army from South Lebanon. Israel was determined to undo that defeat and restore what it calls its deterrence capacity. Deterrence to capacity is one of those polysyllabic terms that people invent to try to convince you that they know something that you don't, which is rarely the case, especially when it comes to political scientists. And usually the reverse is closer to the truth. All it means is to restore the Arab world's fear of Israel, the Israeli point, viewpoint being Arabs and Muslims only understand the language of force, the Israelis having suffered the defeat in May 2000, they need to restore the Arab world's fear of it. They have to use force successfully. And so already from 2001, they began planning and preparing for the next round against the Hezbollah. They waited patiently for a pretext. The pretext came in the summer of 2006, and then Israel unleashed the full force of its uh, army and air force, primarily its air force. But unexpectedly, uh, Israel suffered another defeat in Lebanon at the hands of the party of God. And now Israel was determined 
it had to score a victory. Uh, couldn't yet target Lebanon because it wasn't militarily prepared for yet another uh, tangle with Hezbollah. And so they chose Gaza. And Gaza was the place where Israel was going to restore its deterrence capacity, the Arab world's fear of it. The background to the Gaza assault uh, or invasion uh, has been fairly rapidly effaced, erased from the historical record. Actually, even Gaza and what happened in Gaza has been erased. So for example, three days ago, the senior New York Times correspondent in the Middle East, Ethan Bronner, he was discussing the so-called peace process and doing a retrospective. And he said that, and I'm quoting him, the Israel-Palestine conflict has been drained of any violence in the last few years. So there was no violence in Gaza in 2008-2009. The background really begins January 2006 when there were parliamentary elections in the occupied Palestinian territories and unexpectedly Hamas, the Islamic movement, came out the victor. The former US President Jimmy Carter, he was one of the international observers at the elections and he said they were, I'm quoting him, completely honest and fair. In fact, these were the first elections in the Arab world where a sitting government was voted out of power and a new party came in to replace it. The second case will be Iraq, assuming that the coalition government is formed after the elections. Well. Israel and the United States were not happy with the result of the election, so they punished the people of Gaza for exercising their democratic rights and imposed a blockade and economic sanctions on Gaza. About a year and a half later, Janu June 2007, the Americans and the Israelis were growing impatient with Hamas re retaining power and so the Americans, the Israelis, and some elements among the Palestinian leadership, they attempted a coup to overthrow the uh, elected government. Uh, the coup proved unsuccessful, and now the United States, Israel, they tightened the blockade of Gaza. Amnesty International called the blockade a flagrant violation of international law. Richard Goldstone and his mission, which was commissioned by the UN Human Rights Council, uh, Richard Goldstone later said that the blockade of Gaza was a possible crime against humanity. Around this time, the Irish human rights activist Mary Robinson, she journeyed to Gaza and she said, and now I quote her, she said, Gaza's whole civilization has been destroyed I'm not exaggerating. Gaza's whole civilization has been destroyed. In 2008, in June 2008, Egypt brokered a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas. And under the terms of the ceasefire, each side had obligations. On the side of Hamas, they had to stop the rocket and mortar attacks against Israel. And on the side of Israel, Israel had to gradually lift the blockade of Gaza, the blockade which was a flagrant violation of international law, the blockade which was destroying a civilization. Now, according to the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and now I'm quoting them, they said Hamas was careful to maintain the ceasefire. Hamas was careful to maintain the ceasefire. But Israel reneged on its obligation to gradually lift the blockade of Gaza. What happened next? Well, here the record is quite straightforward, easy enough for a British citizen 
to check it, all you have to do is look at Amnesty International's yearbook for 2009. And if you open your, their yearbook, you'll read the following. A ceasefire agreed in June 2008 between Israel and Palestinian armed groups in Gaza. It held for four and a half months. But it broke down after Israeli forces killed six Palestinian militants in airstrikes and other attacks on November 4th. Beginning roughly around March 2007, Israel had been preparing the attack on Gaza. And by uh, mid-2008, all the pieces were in place. And now all they needed was the pretext, the excuse to go into Gaza. They patiently waited till November 4th, the American election day, knowing full well that the attention of the media and of the public would be riveted to the results of the historic election in the U.S. And on that day, November 4th, Israel invaded Gaza, killed six Palestinian militants, knowing full well that that would evoke or provoke uh, Hamas rocket and mortar attacks. And Israel wanted the rocket and mortar attacks because it needed the pretext to launch the assault on Gaza. But you know those Islamicists, those crazy Muslims, they're so stubborn and they're so fanatical. So Hamas kept saying through the end of December, Hamas kept saying, we're ready to renew the ceasefire. We're prepared to renew the ceasefire. But Israel has to meet its obligations under the ceasefire. It has to gradually lift the blockade of Gaza. Israel said no. Hamas had to stop its rocket and mortar attacks, but Israel would not lift the blockade of Gaza. By the end of December, Sarah Roy of Harvard University, the world's leading authority on Gaza's economy, she also happens to be the daughter of a survivor of Auschwitz concentration camp. Sarah Roy wrote in the London Review of Books, she said, the breakdown of an entire society is happening in front of us in Gaza. But there is little international response beyond UN warnings which are ignored. And at this point, the people of Gaza, Hamas, they were confronted with two stark options. One was to acquiesce in their gradual, their incremental destruction. Or two, to resist, to fight. Hamas opted to resist, although it must be said that the resistance was largely symbolic. The former Israeli commander in Gaza, he said, speaking to his fellow Israeli citizens, he said, you cannot just land blows, leave the Palestinians in Gaza in economic distress, and expect that Hamas will just sit around and do nothing. It's easy enough to condemn Hamas for its rocket and mortar attacks on Israel, and all the human rights organizations did so. But it seems to me that you then have the obligation of showing what should Hamas have done? What was its other option? If you don't present another option, you're in effect saying the people of Gaza had a legal and moral obligation to just lie still and die. In any event, on December 27th, Israel decided to expedite the process, and it invaded Gaza. The assault lasted 22 days till January 18th, what Amnesty International called the 22 days of death and destruction. Well, what did happen during those 22 days? Nowadays, when people refer back to what happened in Gaza to the extent that it's even remembered, um, when people refer back, they speak of the Gaza War, the war in Gaza. Even respected, reputable human rights organizations in the reports they've, re uh, they've released uh, since the attack, they refer to the war in Gaza. And Israel was very emphatic that there was a war in Gaza. In fact, they were very pleased by the fact that there was a war in Gaza because they said after the 22-day assault, they said, now we've shown those Arabs who's who and what's what and who's in charge in this corner of the world. 
And how do we show the Arabs? How do we restore our, our deterrence capacity? Well, they said, we won the war in Gaza. We won the war in Gaza. But then along came an Israeli strategic analyst, and he said, it's very dangerous for Israel to believe it won the war in Gaza when there was no war. In reality, not a single battle was fought during the 22 days of fighting. <coughs> the former Israeli, a, f a former Israeli foreign ministry official, he said, there was no war. Hamas sat in its bunkers and came out when it was all over. Well, if there was no war in Gaza, then what did happen? On the military plane, it's pretty straightforward. The Israelis supplied the statistics. No reason to dispute um, these particular uh, numbers. The war began, or the assault began, with what was called the air phase of the assault, the first week. Uh, and then after 22 days, uh, the Israelis uh, flew about 2,800 to 3,000 combat missions over Gaza. Every plane returned, not a single plane was downed. In fact, not a single plane was even damaged, which is not altogether too surprising because there were no, uh, the Palestinians had no anti-aircraft defenses to speak of. After the first week, January 3rd, began what was called the land and air assault phase of the attack. The Israeli soldiers had special night warfare equipment. Um, Hamas couldn't even see them, let alone tangle with them. So, no fighting, no battles, no planes downed, no planes damaged. Hamas couldn't even see the Israeli soldiers when they entered Gaza. So what did happen in Gaza? And here we have what you might call unimpeachable testimony on what actually happened. We have the testimony of the Israeli soldiers after the invasion. They gave public witness to what they personally experienced. Soldier, there was nothing there ghost towns, except for some livestock, nothing moved. Soldier, most of the time it was boring. There were really not too many events. Soldier, I did not see one single Arab the whole time we were there, that whole week. Soldier, everyone was disappointed about not engaging anyone. Soldier, usually we did not see a living soul, except for our soldiers, of course, not a soul. Soldier, go ahead, ask the other soldiers how often they encountered combatants in Gaza. Nothing, no one. Soldier, there was supposed to be a tiny resistance force upon entering Gaza, but there just wasn't any. It's kind of surreal, a war with one side. It's even kind of funny. There are some people in the second row, and I can see others who are smiling, laughing. Yeah, it would be funny. It would be very humorous, were it not for the other side. And the other side, you should check on your own. It's always good to uh, confirm for yourself. I grew up in a time where a lot of people used to wear a button, a black button with white letters. It said, question authority. And that's a useful thing to keep in mind. There was a very smart little Jewish boy in Europe. He went by the name of Carlos Marx. And uh, Mr. Marx was once asked, what's the credo by which he lives? And because he was a smart little Jewish boy, of course, he answered in Latin. And he said, de omnibus dubitandum. And since I'm at Oxford, when there are a lot of smart little boys and girls, not all Jewish, um, at least half of you must know what that means, the omnibus dubitandum. It means, anyone? I know you're at a loss because you can't Google it. <laughs> and you haven't seen it on YouTube. 
and nobody has text messaged it to you. Uh, it just means to doubt everything. And you should check for yourself, and it's very simple. All you have to do is enter the words, breaking the silence in your Google search. And what will come up on your screen is a collection of the Israeli soldier testimonies on what they experienced. And then you just go to the search function and you enter the word insane. And if you enter the word insane in the search function for this document, it comes up once, twice, three times insane, four times insane, five times insane, six times insane, seven times insane. The soldiers were interviewed separately. They weren't cueing each other, but the same word kept leaping to mind for one soldier after another. Israel used insane amounts of firepower in Gaza. Israel used insane amounts of firepower in Gaza. Israel used insane amounts of firepower in Gaza. No battles, no fighting, no enemy in the field. But Israel is using insane amounts of firepower in Gaza. One soldier said, this was firepower such as I had never known. There were blasts all the time. The earth was constantly shaking. Another soldier said, on the ground you hear these thunderous blasts all day long. I mean, not just tank shelling, which is a tune we'd long gotten used to, but blasts that actually rock the outpost. To the extent that some of us were ordered out of the house we were quartered in for fear it would collapse. The Israeli soldiers entered Gaza, commandeered Palestinian homes, and from the homes they're firing into the horizon. But these insane amounts of firepower are causing the ground underneath them to quake. And so they're told to abandon the houses because the houses might fall on them. So what did happen in Gaza? Well, is there a problem? Okay. So what did happen in Gaza? Actually, the Israeli soldiers themselves provide the most telling metaphors, the most revealing similes of what happened in Gaza. One soldier said, it felt like hunting season had begun. Sometimes it reminded me of a PlayStation computer game. Another soldier said, you felt like a child playing around with a magnifying glass burning up ants. You felt like a child with a magnifying glass burning up ants. It's an interesting image to bear in mind. Uh, a few days ago, there were two Israeli soldiers uh, who were convicted of having used a Palestinian child as a human shield in Gaza. And a couple of days ago, the sentencing, uh, the, the sentence was handed down and the soldiers were uh, uh, given a three month suspended sentence. And the judge had to explain why it was such a a uh, light sentence, a ridiculous sentence, and the judge said, well, you have to bear in mind the dangerous combat conditions in Gaza that the soldiers face, the dangerous combat conditions. Well, I was a child. I'm not proud of the fact that I had my magnifying glass and I focused the rays of the sun, turned the ants into crispy critters. Uh, as I say, I'm not proud of it, but I didn't suffer from the delusion back then that I was engaged in dangerous combat conditions. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, the simile was remarkably apt, like a child with a magnifying glass burning up ants. One of the substances Israel used in Gaza was the white phosphorus. And Israel routinely uses white phosphorus in its conflicts with its uh, neighboring uh, Arab and Muslim countries. I remember as far back as 1982, when I first got involved in the conflict publicly, that uh, Israel was already then using the white phosphorus. I never paid much attention to the details. Sounded kind of sinister, white phosphorus. But this time I did look into the details from curiosity. 
uh, white phosphorus, it reaches a temperature of 816 degrees Celsius. 816 degrees Celsius. Uh, as uh, our own Oprah Winfrey would say, try wrapping your mind around that one. So what does Israel do with the white phosphorus? Well, Human Rights Watch had produced a report called Rain of Fire, uh, describing Israel's use of white phosphorus in Gaza. And Human Rights Watch concluded, and now I'm quoting it, Israel repeatedly exploded white phosphorus munitions in the air over populated areas, killing and injuring civilians and damaging civilian structures. It used the white phosphorus on a school, Beit Lahia school, on a marketplace, on a humanitarian aid warehouse. It used the white phosphorus on two hospitals, on Al Wafa Hospital and on Al Quds Hospital. According to Human Rights Watch, the hospitals were clearly marked, and there does not appear to have been fighting in that immediate area. By the end of the 22 days, 1,400 Palestinians were killed, of whom up to four-fifths, up to two, uh, 1,200 were civilians, 400 were children. On the Israeli side, 13 Israelis were killed, of whom three were civilians, 10 were combatants, and of the 10 combatants, half of them were killed by other Israelis by accident, uh, the technical term being friendly fire. So all told, for every 100 Palestinians killed, one Israeli was killed. For every 400 Palestinian civilians killed, one Israeli civilian was killed. And now you have to use your own faculty of judgment, 100 to 1, 400 to 1, is that a war or is that a massacre? Is it a war or is it a bloodbath? Every time you hear the media or someone you know or you yourself refer to the Gaza war, uh, you have become a, uh, an instrument of, uh, intentionally or not, you become an instrument of Israeli propaganda. Uh, there was no war in Gaza. There was a massacre in Gaza. But of course, Israel has its explanations. Israel has its uh, reasons. It always does. And Israel said that if there were a large number of deaths in Gaza, even a large number of civilian deaths, it's, it wasn't our fault. Because you know Hamas, they're not just crazed, they're also cowards. And they use the Palestinian civilians as human shields. And if Palestinians were killed, it's because uh, Hamas, in effect, forced us to kill uh, Palestinian civilians because Hamas was hiding behind them. So if I were to ask people in this audience how many of you are aware of the allegation by Israel that Hamas had used Palestinian civilians as human shields, how many know that? Raise your hand up high. Uh, so it's virtually everybody in the room. You'd have to be either brain dead or having made excessive use of mind-altering drugs not to be aware of that allegation. It was so widely disseminated. Now, as it happened, all the human rights organizations, they invested that allegation because it was Israel's principal alibi. And so there are by now, by one uh, credible source, there are over 300 human rights reports on what happened in Gaza. And all the major human rights organizations and uh, uh, investigations uh, the Goldstone Report, the Dugard Report, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, and so forth, they all investigate the allegation of human shielding by Hamas. So if I were to ask uh, either of the two women who are busily taking notes, what is the most reputable human rights organization in the world, you would say, yeah, Amnesty International is usually the one that people name. So Amnesty International did do a... Uh, uh, an intensive investigation in the question of human shielding. And this is what Amnesty concluded. Contrary to repeated allegations by Israeli officials of the use of human shields, Amnesty International found no evidence that Hamas or other Palestinian fighters directed the movement of civilians to shield military objectives from attacks. Amnesty International found no evidence that Hamas or other armed groups forced residents to stay in or around buildings used by fighters. 
Amnesty International found no evidence that fighters prevented residents from leaving buildings or areas which had been commandeered by militants. It just didn't happen. Now here's the more interesting question. Uh, I asked how many of you are aware of the allegation that Hamas engaged in human shielding and virtually everybody in the room raised his or her hand. Now, how many of you were aware speaking honestly, candidly, and forthrightly, how many of you are aware that all the human rights organizations that investigate the question came to the same conclusion, that it didn't happen? So raise your hand. Now look around you, it's worth looking. It's about four people. This is Oxford, and this is an audience which is more than averagely interested in the topic. And also incidentally, and not so incidentally, an audience which is almost certainly overwhelmingly sympathetic to the Palestinians. And even here, just a tiny, tiny handful of people know the basic facts. That the issue, the claim, the allegation of human shielding was so far as one can tell from all the human rights organizations, it simply was untrue. Amnesty International went one step further. It said even if it were true that Hamas had engaged in human shielding, and they said there's no evidence to support that allegation, even if it were true, it couldn't explain all the deaths in Gaza. Well, why not? Well, here's what Amnesty said. In the attacks that caused the greatest number of fatalities and injuries, the Palestinian victims were not caught in the crossfire of battles between Palestinian militants and Israeli forces, nor were the Palestinian victims shielding militants or other legitimate targets. So they weren't caught in the crossfire between the Israelis and Hamas. They weren't being used as human shields. How did those 1,400 Palestinians perish? Amnesty said many were killed when their homes were bombed while they slept. Others were going about their daily activities in their homes, sitting in their yard, hanging the laundry on the roof when they were targeted in airstrikes or tank shelling. How did the 400 children die in Gaza? The 400 children prematurely dispatched to their maker. How did they die? Amnesty said the children were studying or playing in their bedrooms or on the roof or outside their homes when they were struck by missiles or tank shells. All the human rights organizations agreed, concluded that Israel had committed multiple war crimes and possibly or definitely crimes against humanity. They all concluded that Hamas committed comparable crimes but on an incomparably smaller scale. After all, how many crimes can ants commit against a child incinerating them with a magnifying glass? After 22 days, Israel withdrew from most of Gaza. Um, now, afterwards, much of the news reportage, the critical news reportage, that said that Israel had fired indiscriminately, haphazardly, in Gaza, but that wasn't entirely true. In fact, a lot of the assault in Gaza was quite discriminate and very far from haphazard because Israel wanted to make sure that after it left Gaza, life would be more miserable for the people there than before it invaded Gaza. So for example, in Gaza there was only one operative flour mill left. It was the El Badr flour mill. And during the assault in Gaza, Israel destroyed the El Badr flour mill to deprive the Palestinians of their only staple. In Gaza, there were 22 ready mix cement factories. Of those 22 ready, excuse me, there were 29 ready mix cement factories. Of those 29, Israel, Israel carefully targeted 22. Why? Because it wanted to make sure after it withdrew the Palestinians couldn't rebuild from the destruction. And there was quite a lot to rebuild. Um, 
there were 600,000 tons, 600,000 tons of rubble left behind when Israel withdrew from Gaza. Uh, about a year and a half later, the whole issue of what was going on in Gaza became a topic of, uh, of uh, note, uh, and Israel claimed that there was no humanitarian crisis in Gaza, that this has all been vastly exaggerated, uh, the condition of the people in Gaza. Uh, the international human rights organizations and humanitarian organizations at that point stepped in. They said Israel was not uh, uh, accurately reporting what's going on in Gaza. Oxfam, the humanitarian organization, it said contrary to what the Israeli government states, the humanitarian aid allowed into Gaza is only a fraction of what is needed to answer the enormous needs of an exhausted people. The World Health Organization said Israel is blocking vital medical supplies from entering the Gaza Strip. The International Committee of the Red Cross has said the blockade is having a devastating impact on the 1.5 million people living in Gaza. And then at this point, a kind of strange debate unfolded in the, in the media uh, and in the public square. On the one hand, Israel was saying, well, conditions are not so bad in Gaza. We've put the people of Gaza on a starvation plus diet. So it wasn't so dire, it was starvation plus. The international humanitarian and human rights organizations, they said, not so. Uh, Israel has put the people of Gaza on a starvation diet. And amidst this debate, it seems to me the most fundamental point was obscured, namely, what right did Israel have to put the people of Gaza on any diet? The, even Israel's harshest critics, even Israel's harshest critics, they did agree with Israel on one point. And the one point was, they said, Israel does have the right, Israel does have the right to prevent weapons from going to Gaza. But that's not entirely clear. Uh, one of the world's leading authorities, but I think he's at Oxford or he could be at Cambridge, I'm not sure, so somebody in the audience can correct me. His name is James Crawford. Uh, is he at Oxford or Cambridge? Anyone know? Well, he's the author of this uh, humongous tome called The Creation of States Under International Law. It's a, a monster book. Uh, I had to read it 50 pages at a time, usually between 1 and 4 a.m. It was very rough going. Uh, the, that fellow must read in his sleep, uh, given the range of his um, references. Uh, but he says the international law is neutral on the question of whether or not a people struggling for self-determination have the right to use armed force. And if they have the right to use armed force, then as B follows from A, they obviously have the right to receive weapons to use armed force to resist uh, their, or to acquire their right to self-determination. Now, some of you might be thinking, and fair enough, you're thinking, well, we didn't come here to talk about armed force, we didn't uh, come here to talk about violence, uh, we want peace, we want to reach a, a uh, settlement of this conflict, and that's, as I said, uh, I can perfectly well sympathize with that. But even if you're of that uh, mindset, still, what even Israel's harshest critics were saying was completely hypocritical. Because the basic facts are these, as Amnesty International pointed out in its report, Fueling Conflict, which it released right after the attack in Gaza, Amnesty said under international law, it's illegal, for, it's illegal to transfer weapons to any consistent violator of human rights. And Amnesty International said yes, Hamas is a consistent violator of human rights, so it's illegal to transfer weapons to Hamas. But Amnesty International said, um, Israel is also a consistent violator of human rights, and it's illegal to transfer weapons to Israel. And so Amnesty said there has to be a total comprehensive, a total comprehensive arms embargo on all parties to the conflict. Now, to the extent that the international community, even Israel's harshest critics, they said Israel had the right to prevent weapons going to Gaza, but didn't also say that we have an obligation to prevent weapons from going to Israel, it was completely hypocritical. 
Uh, in any event, as everybody in this room knows, on May 31st, uh, a flotilla attempted to break the illegal blockade of Gaza, that flagrant violation of international law, which was destroying a civilization. And Israel launched an attack on the, um, on the flotilla, in particular the flagship, the Mavi Marmara. We'll probably never know what happened on that fateful uh, morning, uh, uh, the exact sequence of events, although now we have, I think, a reasonably accurate picture. It's not definitive but certainly seems fairly cre quite credible. Uh, the Human Rights Council at the UN, which I'll make no brief for, I think it's completely unserious, uh, uh, contemptible uh, actually. But it's also true to say that when the Human Rights Council appoints investigative commissions, it generally chooses people of very high repute and distinction. And so in the case of Gaza, it chose Richard Goldstone and also the panel it appointed to investigate what happened in the Mavi Marmara. It was a very credible uh, panel of uh, experts in international law. And they released the report. Time doesn't allow me to go into the details, uh, but the essentials go something like this. They say that Israel began the assault on the Mavi Marmara uh, with the Zodiacs, the inflatable boats, and they used stun grenades uh, or percussion bombs, uh, tear gas, and uh, plastic bullets. After that initial assault was repelled, then they say Israel sent in the helicopters, and they say that Israel began using live ammunition before any Israeli commando hit the deck of the Mavi Marmara. Israel was already using live ammunition against the passengers on the Mavi Marmara before any commando had repelled on the deck. By the end of the assault, nine passengers in the Mavi, Mavi Marmara were dead. According to these jurists, these respected jurists, six of the nine passengers died as a result, and now I'm quoting the report, of summary execution, which is to say in layperson's language, six of the nine passengers were murdered in cold blood. Um, in any case, the exact sequence of events is not really of major importance uh, because everybody here is familiar with the basic facts, and the basic facts decide the fundamental legal question. The basic facts are, number one, Israel was imposing an illegal blockade of Gaza, a flagrant violation of international law because it was a form of collective punishment against the uh, civilian population. Number two, this illegal blockade of Gaza was causing a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And therefore, it follows that Israel had no right to use force to enforce an illegal blockade. And the law is very straightforward. Some of you may want to argue contrarily, well, that, uh, but doesn't Israel have the right to prevent the weapons from going to Gaza? Well, first of all, as I said, in fact, under international law, no, it's not clear that they have the right to prevent weapons from going to Gaza. But the more important point is Israel never even pretended that there were weapons on the Freedom Flotilla. Israel was offered the opportunity to verify by a neutral body such as the Red Cross that there was no ammunition, there were no weapons on the Mavi Marmara. Israel expressed no interest in exercising that option. So as the, uh, investigate, as the uh, panel of uh, the mission of the Human Rights Council concluded, uh, Israel's actions were clearly illegal under international law. Another interesting question, which I don't think has been, told, uh, has been fully explored, is even if you think, even if you're of the opinion that Israel had the right to block the flotilla from going to Gaza. An obvious question is, but then why did they resort to violent force? Even Israeli naval officials acknowledged, they said, Israel could have disabled the propeller on the boat. They could have disabled the rudder on the boat. They could have disabled the engine on the boat and then just towed the boat to the Israeli port of Ashdod. Israel has a formidable navy. It could have simply physically blocked the Freedom Flotilla from getting to Gaza. Even on Israel's own terms, 
even in Israel's own terms, uh, what it did didn't make any sense. Because as most of you recall, in fact, I'm sure all of you recall, the day after the assault in the Mavi Marmara, Israel kept saying in its defense, it kept saying, we didn't expect violence. We expected that they would just engage in passive civil disobedience. We didn't expect them to resort to force. We thought they believed in Gandhi and nonviolence. Okay, but if that's true, then why did you launch the assault in the dead of night? And why did you commence the assault using percussion bombs, tear gas, and maybe plastic bullets? If you really didn't expect violence, which is what Israel emphatically insisted on, then why didn't it just board the boats in broad daylight and bring along lots of journalists to show, to demonstrate their peaceful intentions? The reasonable inference is that Israel wanted a bloody confrontation, although probably not on the scale that ensued after the Israeli commandos panicked at the passengers' determined resistance and then exacted more deaths. That's basically the picture of what happened as far as we know so far. Um, I think of equal importance is uh, what's coming because for Israel, a real problem has now developed. Uh, it suffered a succession of military defeats in 2000 and 2006. Uh, it tried to undo the damage by its assault on Gaza, but most people did not interpret Israel's assault in Gaza as a very impressive display of its martial prowess. Most people, including in the Arab Muslim world, saw it more as a display of cowardice, what was done in Gaza, shameless cowardice. And then Israel suffered the uh, number of setbacks in its commando operations, one in Dubai in the earlier part of the year, even though they successfully assassinated a Hamas leader, it turned into a diplomatic disaster because it was done so ineptly, uh, the assassination teams uh, the killing of the Hamas leader. And then there was the bungled operation in the Mavi Marmara, to which I'll return in a moment. So Israel suffered a succession of military defeats. It uh, suffered a large number of bungled commando operations. And now Israel sees this axis forming in the Arab Muslim world, Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, and then out of the blue, Turkey, Israel's hitherto Israel's foremost, mil uh, foremost ally in the Muslim world. And along comes this guy named Prime Minister Erdogan, and Erdogan is getting carried away. He meets with the Israelis in Davos in the earlier part of the year after the assault in Gaza, and he publicly starts saying to the Israeli President Perez, he says that, you know, you Israelis, you sure know how to kill. Then Mr. Erdogan gets really out of control, and he teams up with the head of state of Brazil to try to negotiate a diplomatic settlement uh, over the nuclear issue with Iran. So what's going on here? These Muslims, these Arabs, they're just getting out of control. The natives are getting restless. They're getting too big for their britches. I mean, Erdogan thinks Turkey is important. It's time to cut these people down to size. And so now Israel it has to cut these people down to size. And the Israeli mindset, the reason why these Arabs, these Muslims, are getting so carried away is because they don't respect our military prowess. We've had a succession of embarrassing defeats. And they climaxed with the assault on the Mavi Marmara because the assault in the Mavi Marmara was uh, carried out, executed by Israel's naval commandos. And those naval commandos are Israel's elite fighting unit. They are the creme de la creme of the Israeli fighting force. And uh, their performance on the Mavi Marmara was not brilliant. Uh, the Israelis said that it was a disgraceful fiasco, a national humiliation not because nine, pa nine passengers were killed, that's you no know, swatting flies, 
but because of the uh, performance of the commandos against the passengers on the boat. Uh, three of the Israeli commandos, the best fighting unit, three of them were captured in the course of the assault. And uh, a former U.S. Marine, who's now a British citizen, Ken O'Keefe, he later said that the three who were captured, he said they looked like frightened children in the face of an abusive father. They looked like frightened children in the face of an abusive father. Well, some of you are laughing, and the very fact that you're laughing is no laughing matter for Israel because that's not the image Israel wants to project to its foes or its friends of Israel's fighting force, let alone of the Israeli, Israel's elite naval commandos. One Israeli general said after the assault in the Mavi Mamra, he said, it's one thing for people to think we're crazy, that's okay, but it's bad when they think we're incompetent and crazy. That's, and that's the way we look. And so now Israel has to do something in order to restore the Arab world's fear of it. And uh, it has to do something pretty spectacular. As far as one can tell from now, uh, Israel is targeting Lebanon in order to restore its deterrence capacity. Uh, the former U.S. ambassador to Israel, Daniel Kurtzer, he recently wrote that the speculation is Israel will attack Lebanon in the next 12 to 18 months. And as we are st uh, sitting here, you see, if I can use the expression, we see before our eyes the sinister plot unfold. Uh, the United Nations Security Council its assigned role is going to be to soften up Lebanon before Israel goes in for the kill. So if you look at the developments, say, in just the last a week or so, first of all, Israel announced that it was withdrawing from the uh, northern part of the village of Gajar on the Lebanese-Israel border. Now, that was quite surprising news because, as we all know, Israel is the house guest that never leaves. And so why was it withdrawing from Gadjar? Uh, I immediately understood, it may sound immodest, but I knew exactly what was going on, uh, because under UN Resolution 1701, which was passed after the 2006 war, uh, it had two crucial conditions. On the Israeli side, they had to withdraw from Gadjar, the northern part of Gadjar. And then on the Lebanese side, they have to disarm Hezbollah. And so, Israel announced, we're in compliance with 1701, so now it's time to put Hezbollah in compliance with 1701. And it wasn't a surprise, the next day I looked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, and the first thing they said is, we're leaving Gajar, item two, time to disarm Hezbollah. And then I turned to the United Nations uh, website, their official website, and the home page there was a little video, and the little video was one of the British reps, his name is Michael Williams, and Michael Williams is the UN Special Representative to Lebanon, and they have a little video of him announcing Israel is leaving Gajar, and now it's time to implement the whole of 1701. Okay, and then as you know, uh, in the next week or so, the Special Tribunal on Lebanon is supposed to deliver its indictments on who killed Rafiq Hariri, uh, the Israeli, excuse me, the Lebanese Prime Minister in 2005. Now, does anyone want to guess who the STL, the Special Tribunal in Lebanon, is going to indict? Well, of course, they're going to invite, indict Hezbollah for the killing of Hariri. And then you watch how all the uh, Western powers how they all act in concert, uh, and each of them gets a cameo uh, appearance. So when uh, Netanyahu announced the withdrawal from Gajar, he said, I'm doing it on the recommendation of the Italian foreign minister. So now all of a sudden, the Italian foreign minister gets his little cameo appearance in the plot. And then a few days ago, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, it um, uh, had a uh, special investigative report based on leaked information from the STL on who killed, the title was, Who Killed Rafiq Harari? 
And guess who CDC concluded on the basis of its special investigative report using secret leaked information, guess who they concluded killed Rafiq Hariri? Well, of course, Hezbollah. Uh, and so everybody gets to play a part as the UN Security Council, which regrettably has become uh, in the post, uh, since 1991, the UN Security Council has become the main instrument for death and destruction in our world. It's a sorry commentary, but it happens to be accurate, I think. Uh, and they perform the role of softening the target. So they're going to say Lebanon is in violation of Resolution 1701, and they're going to start with the resolutions, then will come the sanctions to put pressure on the Lebanese to pressure Hezbollah to disarm. Then the STL, the Special Tribunal on Lebanon, is going to indict the Hezbollah, and that's going to create discord between the Shia and Sunni in Lebanon because Mr. Harari was Sunni, and there's a lot of sectarian passion over the issue of who killed Rafiq Harari. And so they're going to now orchestrate the dissent and discord among the Lebanese, internally weaken them, and then when the right moment comes, Israel will f uh, find a pretext, as it always does, to go in for the kill. Uh, it's all quite sinister, in my opinion. It's all quite uh, evil, if we can use that word. And it's also uh, playing with fire. Um, the Israelis have already made clear what they're going to do in Lebanon. They said that we're going to continue to apply the Dahya doctrine. Uh, anyone here from Lebanon in the audience? Raise your hand. Okay, so if you're from Lebanon, you'll know much better than I do. Then the Dahya is a southern suburb of Beirut, and it's the home to the mostly poor uh, Shia population, which is very loyal to the Hezbollah civilian population. And in 2006, when Israel attacked Lebanon, it turned the Dahya into a parking lot. There was nothing left. It was just completely flat. I visited at the time, except for the craters, um, and occasionally in the distance, some scaffolding. Uh, and the Israelis were very proud of what they did in the Dahya, and they coined the term and the term was the Dahya Doctrine, uh, basically the use of pulverizing force against civilians and civilian infrastructure. Their first application of the Dahya Doctrine was in Gaza. At the time, they said, we're using the Dahya Doctrine. Uh, and uh, they said in the future, they're going to apply it again, which means Lebanon. Now, on one point, Israel and Hezbollah agree. Uh, Israeli officials say that the next war will be game changing. The head of Hezbollah, Syed Nasrallah, he says the next war will change the face of this region. Uh, Mr. Nasrallah has given a series of speeches the past year, and he has repeatedly said that the time has passed when the Arab world is going to be used as a shooting gallery by Israel. In the event of another war, he said it will be tit for tat an airport for an airport, a port for a port, a city for a city, a building for a building, a power station for a power station, a factory for a factory. Mr. Nasrallah's entire reputation, and he knows it, it rests on the fact that there's an exact correspondence between his words and his deeds. So there's every reason to suppose that Nasrallah means what he says and will, in fact, must do what he promises. And then you have to ask yourself what's going to happen or how is Israel going to react when the missiles start heading towards Tel Aviv? And the Israelis have already repeatedly said they expect in the next war the missiles will be attacking Tel Aviv. Uh, last uh, a few days ago, uh, the head of Israeli military intelligence, he just retired, and part of his retirement speak, speech, he said that, well, people are under a misapprehension by the fact it's been calm for the last few years, that it's not quite as calm as it looks, and he says, we expect that missiles will come to Tel Aviv in the next war. And then you have to ask yourself, how will Israel, or speculate on how Israel will react if the missiles start targeting Tel Aviv and there are significant civilian casualties. The prospect grows yet more terrifying when one considers 
that Israel will not allow for another defeat in Lebanon. It's just not possible. Everything I've said so far, I agree, it's speculation. You can say a higher or lower level of speculation, but speculative. But one thing I think is quite certain, that in the event of a war, uh, there is no possibility that Israel will allow for a defeat. Uh, before, if a defeat seems impending, let's just say Israel will do what it has to do to make sure it does not suffer a third consecutive defeat at the hands of the party of God. On the other hand, uh, the, um, uh, even if it looks as if Hamas is uh, uh, on the verge of defeat, Iran will not allow, I don't think, Iran will allow a Hezbollah defeat, not from any sense of solidarity, but from national survival, because Iran knows full well a defeat for Hezbollah will be the first step towards uh, an assault on Iran. Uh, that's the only reason Iran did not, it was very clear in 2006 that the purpose of the assault was to prepare the ground for an attack on Iran. Iran didn't enter in 2006 for a very simple reason, Hezbollah won on its own. But if it looks like Hezbollah is losing, then I think it's almost certain that Iran will uh, enter. Uh, the bottom line is neither side will accept a, a defeat. If uh, hostilities break out, an Israeli attack on Hezbollah will consequently trigger a chain reaction, the outcome of which no sane person would want to contemplate. Now it's to my mind, I think it's pretty clear what the U.S. Uh, and the other Western powers are going to do. They're going to try to focus the conflict laser-like on, ha on Hezbollah, and they're going to make it exceedingly difficult for Iran and Syria to support the Hezbollah because there will be the arms embargo, there will be the sanctions, and it will make it almost impossible Iran and uh, Syria to come to the Hezbollah's defense because then it will be saying they're breaking international law and well, all of you know the whole story. I don't have to tell you. Uh, whether they'll succeed or not, I don't know. Uh, there is a question, uh, why are they all involved in this plot? Okay, the Israelis, they want to restore their deterrence capacity, but the U.S., France, Britain, Italy, Canada, Canada. CBC has a special. I mean, there are probably three people in Canada who have ever heard of Rafi Kareri. And CBC has a three part special on it. You know? And I think the answer is, and here again, it's a matter of speculation, uh, but I'm saying it with a, a, a certain amount of gravity, seriousness. They all loathe the Hezbollah. They loathe the Hezbollah for a couple of reasons. One, because Hezbollah is a non-state actor, and you're not supposed to have non-states carrying around, carrying on as if they're important. To be a head of state or a member of a state is an exclusive club, and Mr. Nisrallah is carrying around like he's the head of state of Lebanon, and he doesn't have the right, the prerogative to join that club because he's not the head of, he's not a head of state, legally speaking. But the other more important reason, in my opinion, is because the Western world likes stupid, uh, stupid, ignorant, incompetent, and corrupt leaders in the Arab and Muslim world. Uh, they've grown accustomed to that fact, and they feel very, uh, uh, very uh, ill at ease when along comes a Muslim Arab leader who is uh, very smart, uh, very competent, and so far, at least, so far, uh, he personally is incorruptible. And so he has to be gotten rid of. The ideal, uh, the ideal leader for an Arab Muslim, the Arab Muslim world is uh, you know, someone like the rotting carcass, uh, the uh, laughing bovine in Egypt, uh, Mr. Mubarak, or that preposterous buffoon, uh, King Abdullah in Jordan, or those seventh century goat herders in Saudi Arabia. That's, 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 the <clears throat> that's the perfect leader for the Arab world and the Muslim world. Uh, and uh, it was very, it's very striking when you see the contrast with Mr. Nasrallah. He's not a blowhard, and the blowhards seem to, uh, there are good blowhards, you know, someone like Mr. Um, 
Um, uh, there are good blowhards, someone like, uh, okay, there's uh, Jody and Shadia. Um, there are good blowhards, like Mr. Nasser of Egypt, but he was a blowhard. Uh, and then there are bad blowhards, like Saddam Hussein, but Mr. Uh, Nasrallah is neither. Uh, and he's a problem for the Muslim Arab world. He's a problem for the Western world because he's serious. It was very striking, for example, or at least it was striking to me. Uh, I was reading his last speech, which he gave last week, the Martyr's Day speech. And in his last speech, the Martyr's Day speech, uh, Mr. Nasrallah, he not only cited Tony Blair's memoir, but he actually cited George Bush's memoir. Now, Bush's memoir had only come out five days earlier. It was only published five days earlier. And he was already citing it. Now, he obviously, or apparently, he read the memoir before George Bush read it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, when you compare him with the ideal Arab leaders, you know, someone like, um, uh, Mr. Mubarak, who probably the only book he's ever read was The Complete Guide to Chewing Grass, or um, King Abdullah, The Instructions to PlayStation Computer Game, uh, Saudi Arabia's Read. No, let's not even go there. Um, and so they have to get rid of this guy uh, because he's carrying on in a, in a serious, dignified fashion, uh, and he has to be gotten rid of. That's not who we, uh, that's not the Arab world's uh, leader. We like people like, you know, Mubarak, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Abdullah, and uh, of course we love uh, Abbas uh, from the Palestinian Authority. Some of you may not know it. Uh, I don't want in any way to diminish his credentials. Um, the, uh, Mr. Abbas, he is a doctor. Yes, he is. He has his doctorate. Uh, how many people are aware of that? Yes, he got his doctorate. He got it in Russia. He wrote his doctoral dissertation uh, saying there was no Nazi Holocaust. Uh, so as you can see, and that was, his, that was at his intellectual peak <laughs> when he wrote that. So he's the perfect, the perfect leader for the Palestinians. Some of you might be wondering, well, wait one second, wait, 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 wait. Uh, Abbas, he's a Holocaust denier. And doesn't Israel and the United States, don't they not like Holocaust deniers like Ahmadinejad? Uh, well, some of you, you know, you're at Oxford, but obviously you've suffered from uh, cultural deficit because you haven't seen The Wizard of Oz. Have you seen The Wizard of Oz? How many of you have seen it? Okay, well, you'll know that in The Wizard of Oz there are good witches and there are bad witches. Good witches like the beautiful Glenda and bad witches like whatever her name is, I've forgotten. And just like there are good witches and bad witches, there are good Holocaust deniers and bad Holocaust deniers. Uh, Ahmadinejad, he's a bad Holocaust denier. Uh, but Abbas, he's a good Holocaust denier because he follows American orders. And that's what they want in the Arab world. They like imbeciles to be heads of state. And so Mr. Nasrallah has to be gotten rid of. Um, where do we stand now? Well, the blockade of Gaza, that inhuman, merciless, heartless blockade of Gaza, it continues. There seemed to be a moment of hope after the uh, assault in the Mahdi Mamara, where pressure was put on Israel to lift the blockade. But six months later, just this past week, John Ging, who's the director of operations for UNRWA, the main, uh, human right, the main humanitarian organization working in Gaza, uh, John King said, and I'm quoting him, there's been no tangible change for the people on the ground. Uh, the moment passed and Israel, well, it got away with it. On the other hand, we shouldn't for a moment, in my opinion, underestimate the historic achievement of the people on the f uh, Freedom Flotilla. Uh, it was uh, a, a nonviolent international grassroots initiative that proved able to force the hands of the world's mightiest powers. Uh, for three years, Israel had that brutal, heartless, merciless blockade on Gaza. Uh, the last stage began in June 2007 until the end of May. 
that a single world leader said anything about it, not a peep. And then the day after the assault and the Marvi Marmara and the martyrdom of the nine passengers, all of a sudden all the world leaders singly and in unison, Hillary Clinton, then your uh, foreign minister, then the UN Security Council, everyone began to say the Israeli siege of Gaza was unsustainable and had to be lifted. The siege was unsustainable. Um, it, it, the prison gates of Gaza, they've only been pried open uh, only a few inches. That's true, but I, I think those inches show uh, the latent power, the power that we have uh, uh, if we are able to organize, discipline ourselves, uh, and appeal to the public on the simple truth that the occupation is inhuman and unjust. If the Mavi Marmara shows us what we can and should be doing, namely organizing ourselves uh, and uh, getting our act together, the so-called peace process, uh, the soap opera that's played out in Washington, uh, Tel Aviv, and uh, Ramallah, it should show us what we should not do. It's just to say we shouldn't squander any energy, any time, any investment emotionally in that peace process because the simple fact is there is no peace process. There was no peace process and there won't be a peace process for the foreseeable future. I know that's easy rhetoric, but it's not just rhetoric. It's a, uh, uh, something that a sensible or rational person concludes looking at the documentary record. So let's take a simple illustration of what I'm trying to say. So we have a gentleman sitting in the second row. What's your name, sir? Yes. Ahmed. So Ahmed, he has a grandson. We'll call his grandson for argument's sake. We'll call him Johnny. And Johnny tells, Johnny tells Baba that uh, Johnny's five years old. And he tells Baba, I'm going to be a doctor when I grow up. And Ahmed is very proud of his son, Johnny, chip off the old block, he's going to be a doctor. Well, Johnny starts going to school, he's not really the brightest light on the circuit, isn't doing exactly terrific in school. By junior high school, he's cutting classes, hanging around with the wrong kids. By the time he's in uh, uh, high school, he's involved with gangs and dealing drugs, uh, robs banks, kills the tellers goes before the judge, gets sentenced to life, and then Ahmed, I see how sad your eyes are. Uh, Ahmed goes, visits little Johnny, who's now Big John, visits him in jail, and little Johnny, Big John, he says to Baba, I'm gonna be a doctor. Well, at this point, Ahmed gives him a smack in the face. No, you're not. So some of you are wondering, well, what does that have to do with the peace process? And maybe I took an excessive amount of mind-altering drugs but no, it has everything to do with the peace process because little Johnny's odyssey uh, lasted about 17 years before he was locked up. And this so-called peace process has lasted about 17 years also. It's said to have begun in September 1993 with the famous White House handshake, the Oslo Peace Accord, and so forth. And over and over again, they keep talking about the peace process, the peace process, the peace process, like little Johnny, I'm gonna be a doctor, I'm gonna be a doctor, I'm gonna be a doctor. But a rational person doesn't judge a process by what people say. A rational peace person judges by results, by outcomes, by actions. Not what, what little Johnny says he's going to be, but what little Johnny is doing. So let's apply that basic principle to the peace process. In, two th in th uh, 1993, when the process was said to have begun, there were 250,000 illegal Jewish settlers in the occupied Palestinian territories. 17 years later, there are now 500,000 illegal Jewish settlers in the occupied Palestinian territories. The number has doubled. According to Beth Selm, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, Israel has annexed 42% of the West Bank for the settlements. So if you look at outcomes and results, there's not been a peace process, there has been an annexation process. That's what you, that's what you see when you look at results and outcomes. And in fact, the annexation process, it needs the peace process. 
because were it not for the peace process, the annexation process couldn't go on. What do I mean? Every time Israel is called to account for its settlements, for its settlement expansion, for its settlement growth, what does Israel say? It says we'll resolve it in the peace process. And so the peace process enables the annexation process. Some of you are thinking, but wait a minute, maybe that's true for the past, but haven't things changed now? Isn't it true that there was a settlement freeze uh, for 10 months? And aren't we trying now to extend the settlement freeze? Well, was there a settlement freeze? The settlement freeze technically began in November 2009 and extended to September 26, 2010. Well, Peace Now, the main Israeli organization monitoring Israeli settlement growth in the occupied territories, it looked at a 10-month period, and this is what it said. On the ground, there was almost no freeze or even a visible slowdown. Settlement freeze, it was a fiction right from the outset. There was no settlement freeze. Now, some of you are wondering, wait, 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 that can't be. We can't be so bold-facedly being lied to. Well, no, not exactly. What happened was when Israel announced the settlement freeze, it said there would be no new construction in the West Bank. So what happened? About six months before, about six months before Mr. Netanyahu announced the settlement freeze, he just told the settlers, build lots of foundations for houses. Just build the foundations. And so I'll announce the settlement freeze on new construction, but you can still continue building all of those houses because it's not new construction. You had already laid the foundations. Does that mean the whole thing was a charade? The whole thing was duplicitous? The whole thing was disingenuous? Well, not entirely. Peace Now said, and I'm quoting, they said, Benjamin Netanyahu, he'll probably not win the Nobel Peace Prize, but he is certainly likely to win the Nobel Prize for physics or at least chemistry. Why? Because Mr. Netanyahu discovered that contrary to what scientists had thought until now, water is not the only substance that expands instead of contracting when it freezes. Uh, there's no point, as I said, investing any hope in the peace process. There's no hope, in my opinion, investing any hope in uh, Barack Obama. Uh, Barack Obama, as far as we know, his current proposal to the Israelis is number one. He said in exchange for a 90-day settlement freeze. And you have to bear in mind that settlements are illegal under international law. That's the opinion of all 15 judges in the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, in 2004, July 2004, all 15 judges, including the American judge, Thomas Bergenthal, and the British judge, uh, Rosalind Higgins, who, by the way, is Jewish by birth. She married an, Irish, uh, an Irishman. Uh, Rosalind Higgins, Thomas Bergenthal, they sit in the IC, or sat in ICJ, and Bergenthal has retired. Uh, they all agreed that the settlements are illegal. In fact, under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the settlements constitute a war crime. So Mr. Obama has promised that if Israel will stop committing war crimes for 90 days, if Israel will stop committing war crimes for 90 days, they'll get an automatic veto in the United Nations, they'll get an additional $3 billion in aid, and Israel will commit itself to the, excuse me, the U.S. will commit itself to never again asking Israel to stop committing war crimes, to stop uh, building settlements in the occupied territories. So uh, it seems to me our challenge is to muster sufficient political will so that Mr. Obama, your own head of state, uh, that they do the right thing, or at any rate, they stop doing the wrong thing, regardless of what they want to do. When you focus on the powers on high, when you wait for a messiah, even a black messiah, it's a confession of impotence. The simple but fundamental truth of politics, and here I say it as a non-believer, the uh, simple but fundamental truth of politics is God helps those who help themselves. We have to act. We have to do something. And there are many very impressive people in this room who I know and who are actors. I don't know enough of them on the British scene, but I see uh, Nancy uh, uh, in the back, Nancy Lay, uh, Shadia Mansour, Jody McIntyre, 
there are the examples we should be looking at. And I mean that seriously. We're completely wasting our time, and we shouldn't waste our time because time is precious and energy is precious uh, on these meaningless sideshows like the so-called peace process. <coughs> I've been at this for about 30 years now. Sometimes I despair, sometimes I feel hopeless, and a lot of time I wonder what's the wisest uh, uh, choice I made in life to spend about 30 years on this tiny pinprick on the world's map called Israel-Palestine, total population, at least in the occupied territories in Israel, the size of Cairo, uh, not even the size of many a city in China, and why invest a whole life in that? Uh, and there's a lot of reason to be hopeless and despairing, but I think there's also a lot of grounds for hope now public opinion is changing, Jewish public opinion is changing. Uh, Jews outside Israel, Jews are, tend to be liberal. 80% uh, of American Jews vote for Barack Obama, which was a higher percentage than even Latinos who vote for Barack Obama. Uh, Jews are by far and away the richest ethnic group in the United States, so they voted with their pocketbooks, they should be voting Republican, certainly much more so than Latinos who are among the poorer ethnic populations, but no, Jews are liberal. And being liberal means you support the rule of law, you support equality under the law, you support human rights. Amnesty International is a liberal organization, Human Rights Watch is a liberal organization, you support international organizations. And um, Israel, Jews have found it more and more difficult to rec reconcile their liberal, uh, liberal idea ideas, ideology, uh, with Israeli actions. It's just not possible any longer. You're a young person at Oxford, Oxford University. You're um, Jewish. You're liberal. You don't want to have to defend dropping white phosphorus on hospitals. It's just, you know, if you're a right-wing thug, uh, okay, you can do it, but Jews are liberal. And so public opinion is changing. And we have a real op opportunity now. We have a real opportunity to reach the public to reach deep inside the public, to reach the mainstream. And we can achieve that if we do, in my opinion, two things. Number one, we have to be principled. And principled means that you, you support the, the rights of Palestinians, which have been endorsed by international law. The law is very clear on what rights Palestinians have. It's been decided upon the highest judicial bodies in the world and the mainstream human rights organizations. Um, and in the general UN General Assembly, the most respected and most representative institutions in the world. Palestinians have the right of self-determination, the whole of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. Those are, according to the International Court of Justice, the whole of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. Those are occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, the settlements are illegal under international law, and uh, the Palestinian refugees from 1948 and 67 and successive generations which have maintained genuine links with the land, they have the right to return and compensation. That's the law. And being principled means, in my opinion, to uphold the rights of the Palestinians. Nobody has the right to tell Palestinians that they have to forfeit any of their rights in order to achieve a settlement. No, your obligation is, or our obligation is, to support their rights because it's their rights. Uh, if you don't want to support their rights, then my opinion, and this may sound a little crude, then you should shut up. But you don't have the right to tell Palestinians that they have an obligation to forfeit their rights. On the other hand, we have to be reasonable. We have to show the other side, we have to show Israel, and we have to show its supporters. There is a way out. This conflict does not have to go on through eternity. It simply requires that we respect the rights of and respect the human dignity of the people of Palestine. If you respect their rights, you respect their human dignity, then there is a settlement that's possible of the conflict. Uh, the late Professor Edward Said, he, at the end of his life, he liked to quote uh, the Caribbean poet M. A. Cesar, that there is room for everyone at the rendezvous of victory. It's a quite beautiful line. I think there's room for everyone at the rendezvous of victory. And uh, there is room for everyone. Just be reasonable. Just be decent. 
disrespect the dignity and the humanity of the people of Palestine. If you're willing, be willing to be reasonable, willing to be decent, and there's room for you at that rendezvous of victory. We're not talking about victor and vanquished. I don't want to be victor over anyone if it means there's somebody vanquished. We're talking about a settlement that respects the human dignity, the human decency of everyone. And there's room for everyone. Now, I'm determined, I'm determined that I'm going to get there at that rendezvous of victory. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going to walk to it. I'm not sure if I'm going to need a cane. I'm not sure if it's going to be on a wheelchair. And I'm not sure if Nancy is going to have to carry me on a stretcher with life support systems accompanying me. But I want to be there at that rendezvous of victory. But there's one condition. I can only get there if you're there with me. We have to do it together. So I hope to see everyone at that rendezvous of victory. Thank you.